Welcome to Good Game, I'm Bajo. And I'm Hex. Hex, do you like role playing? Yep. Do you like retro? Yes. Do you like being abandoned on a beach? No. And two out of three ain't bad. We've got all of that and more this week, including the survival madness of discourse. What is going on? Drama Tartar on the body. Axiom Verge's 8-bit nostalgia served with a side of sci-fi. And we assemble a party for some old-school dungeon crawling in Pillars of Eternity. No way would they let something like that happen in Gilded Vale. That's what they all said. But before all that, can you name the game for this week? Axiom Verge is basically a new Super Metroid. Uh, no, Mr. Editor, that is actually Super Metroid. Try again. That's better. <laughs> I was surprised to learn that this was made solely by one guy, Thomas Happ. He was the artist, programmer, writer and musician all rolled into one mega developer. Yes, that's a multi-talent right there, but it also took him five years to make this game. It's the far future world of 2005. You play as Trace, a scientist who finds himself stuck in some strange alien world after an experiment goes wrong. Then you're thrown straight into this weird world with nothing but the shirt on your back and pants. Yes, although there is an easter egg that lets you take your pants off. Mm, well, I think pants should be optional in every game. Mm. Pants or no pants, you set off exploring, finding new weapons and power-ups to try, and unlock new parts of the world. It's super traditional Metroid exploration. Even the style of the map is the same as Metroid. Although, the map is probably my only real complaint. I just got a bit frustrated with it towards the end of the game. There's no objective markers anywhere and no guide to what equipment or powers will unlock doors. You just have to find your own way and try and remember where everything is for yourself. Yeah, I didn't mind that though. I thought the game was pretty good at signposting where to go. You do always have to keep a mental picture of the world in your mind, but I always knew of some new area to go and explore. I was never really lost. Oh, really? I felt lost for ages. There were a few times where I ended up just going completely the wrong way and had almost no idea where to go next. <laughs> like a little arrow or something to point me in the right direction would have been nice. But that's part of the experience, Hex. A sense of mystery and exploration. Not knowing where to go. Being frustrated. Okay. <laughs> Anytime I did end up going the wrong direction or backtracking, there was always some little secret I'd find along the way. So I was always making progress. It's really hard to find some of those secrets though, isn't it? Yes, well they are called secrets. Yeah, well I'm saying it's really good that they're so well hidden because then it feels really rewarding when you do actually discover one. For example, you have this mining drill that can break through special bits of wall, but secret walls don't give you any hint that they're there. Yes, the best you can hope for is something in the level design or platforming that hints that there's a secret passage nearby. There's no cracked bricks or anything like that, so I just ended up drilling pretty much every wall just in case. <laughs> Tell me about it. I think I extended my playtime by at least a few hours just because of my compulsive need to drill. These are the things us gamers do. Even so, by the end of the game, my final stats showed that even though I explored over 90% of the map, I'd only found about two-thirds of the items. So many hidden treasures! There's a huge amount of guns and gear to find. And while there are some really cool guns, I ended up only using a handful of them. Most just felt a bit useless. But a lot of the abilities you unlock are awesome. Teleports, grappling hooks, remote drones that look a bit like snarks from Half-Life. And you often have to combine them in interesting ways in order to reach new areas. So even when something looked unreachable, usually it just came down to thinking through it a little better. The Disruptor Gun is my favourite hex because it basically lets you glitch out the game. It lets you access new areas and create platforms, and every enemy can be glitched out too. Yeah, it's a cool idea, and it's worth glitching out all of the enemies just to see what happens. It might make enemies spew out health or move really slowly, and sometimes they even reveal special secrets. Although it can just make some hard in a different way. What did you think of the story? Yeah, I quite liked it. To be honest, I don't feel like this kind of game needs a truly in-depth story. It just needs an interesting premise, and it's got that. 
And, you know, there's some fun little twists and turns in there too. Yeah, for me, these games live or die on how well they can create intrigue and mystery with their level design and art. And in that respect, I think he's nailed it. There's some great locations and the soundtrack really sets the mood. It's a world you want to explore and learn about. Absolutely. We should wrap this up though. Final thoughts? I feel like this is a game which got lost in the 80s and has only just been uncovered. It's a great mix of nostalgia and timeless design. I'm giving it four and a half. Yeah, I agree. This is the best Super Metroid since Super Metroid. And I'm amazed that one guy did it all. I'm giving it four out of five. I dare say, now it's time for the news with Goose. Oh. Here's what's making headlines. Microsoft is attempting to shut down efforts to access the Russian exclusive free-to-play Halo Online. A leaked early build of the game was obtained by a team of modders who then created a tool titled El Dorito, which allowed players to explore the build. Microsoft promptly issued a takedown notice to the hosting website and the files have since been removed. However, the modders have vowed that they will keep trying to distribute the files. A recent report by advertising research group iSpot TV has revealed that free-to-play mobile game advertising has eclipsed traditional console ads for the first time. Looking at just the first quarter of 2015, it estimated that four of the top five ad spends belong to mobile game developers, collectively spending over 170 million Australian dollars of the nearly 280 million total. The three biggest spenders included Game of War's Machine Zone, Clash of Clans' Supercell, and Candy Crush's King. And that's all for this week. Thanks, Goose. Discourse is a crowdsourced indie game that describes itself as an interactive choose-your-own-adventure. You play as Rita, who is stranded on an island with a handful of survivors after a plane crash. The scenario is very much in the vein of the TV show Lost. There's a collection of different passengers, you all need to figure out how to survive, and you quickly find yourself making decisions for the group. True to the game's choose-your-own-adventure formula, gameplay is very much centred around narrative choice. Mechanics are limited to basic movement and an interaction button, so it's simple but it all feels quite intuitive and very polished. And like many narrative-based games, the decisions that you make don't always have the outcome you hope for. Yeah, even the first person I tried to save was a failure. It just ended up screwing things up for them and helping the other guy. But the best thing about this game is just how many different directions it can go in. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, so often with interactive storytelling, you're led to believe that the choices you're making will lead to wildly different outcomes, but in reality, you're kind of just being sneakily funneled back around to the same result. But not here. This game is short, but that's good because you're going to want to play this again and again. There's so many different ways it can go. Let's look at the characters, which are diverse and outspoken. And you'll learn a lot during your conversations with each of them. There's Rita, our protagonist. She's a hipster barista who makes for an unlikely leader of this island crew, but also seems the most self-aware. Then there's Steve, the nihilistic and depressed. Teddy is a paranoid conspiracy theorist. Exactly the kind of people you want to be trapped on an island with. Then there's George and Jolene, an older married couple. And Garrett, the gamer. Each character is funny and interesting in their own way and very much unpredictable. Yeah, you immediately begin to pick your favourites, don't you? Or at least the ones you feel will be the most useful to the group. Yeah, but they all have good and bad qualities, so it's quite hard to really like anyone. Except this kitty. Oh, kitty. Well, what about George? I thought George was sweet. Although I got him killed pretty quickly. Sorry, George. George and Jolene were interesting because I liked them both at first. But in a second playthrough, I made some different decisions that led me to some new information regarding their relationship. And then suddenly, I was all about protecting George. I really liked Garrett. I mean, obviously I had a soft spot for him because he was a gamer and he got picked on a little bit for that. But he also had some really lovely game-related references. And in certain situations, his game-related knowledge made him really useful in exploring certain parts of the island. But then there were other moments where he'd be really cowardly and self-serving, so I let him get eaten by a shark. 
Your goal, of course, is to get off the island with as many survivors as possible. I'm not even sure if you can get off with everyone alive. Maybe there is some sort of particular set of choices that will lead to that outcome. But I rarely made it off with more than half the group. Yeah, there's just so many weird ways it can go. In my first playthrough, we ended up setting up a colony on the other side of the island. And after taking a vote, we elected and I forgot to mention this character, Disky as our leader. Ah, uh, Disky. I take this as a reference to Castaway, where you imbue an inanimate object with a persona. Disky is a random yellow disc you can find in the wreckage, and the group decides to give it a name. Wilson! <laughs> yeah, but how we got from that to worshipping it as our leader, I just don't know. <laughs> It all just happened really quickly, and sometimes I don't even make the decisions that result in people dying. I just woke up one day and Garrett's head was on a pike. I could hear Apparently a victim of Disky's wrath. It's that island fever, Hex. Everyone starts going a little crazy. After your first playthrough, you also unlock the ability to rewind the day meaning you can go back and restart from the beginning of any day, altering the timeline from there. And that means you don't have to replay the entire game every single time if you don't want to. Or if you just want to change one specific choice that led to the death of a character. I had fun with this, Hex. What about you? Yeah, it's got great personality, it was funny, and I was making real, audible WTF exclamations all the way through, which is a good sign. I was concerned at first that it was so short, but once I realised how genuinely different all of these various paths and outcomes were, I realised that the longevity of the game comes from repeat playthroughs. Yeah, and as we've said, it's refreshing to play a narrative game where all the outcomes are so wildly different. This is great. I'm giving it three and a half stars. I'm giving it three and a half as well. In the ancient battle between the Nintendo Entertainment System and the Sega Master System, Nintendo won. It was always in the lead. Competing with Super Mario was an impossible task. The game was just too damn good. But there was one game which tried to compete and nearly got there. If you owned a Sega Master System 2 in Australia, then you also owned Alex Kidd in Miracle World. And you were fortunate. Alex Kidd in Miracle World was released as a cartridge-based game first, but then it was integrated into the Master System 2 with a few minor tweaks. You played Alex, a prince from the land of Redaxion, who was kidnapped by evil men as a small boy. Your mission was to fight back a tyrant, Jankin the Great, and save your people. Miracle World was a big game. It was full of tough platforming, tricky enemy setups, and lots of things to punch. Alex appeared to have a disproportionately large fist, which he used to smash blocks and enemies to help him collect bags of cash. He could spend this cash on things like a fire ring, a sick motorbike to speed through the levels, a bubble copter, and the mystery box. Ooh. I know every inch of this game. From that opening drop-down sequence, where you fall into the calming ocean below, Oh, that music has burned into my brain, as I'm sure it is for many of you too. Some of my favourite sections were the boss fights, which took the form of scissors, paper, rock competitions with some of the creepiest henchmen I've ever seen. I can't remember if these fights had a particular strategy to them, but they were always tense. Oh, this game beat me down. It was just so hard to stay alive. The platforming was unforgiving, especially the castle levels. Hearing that music even now gives me the chills. Bats and spikes and fire. Ugh. Alex Kidd wasn't a Mario or a Sonic, but he still had one of the best platformers on the Master System. He was one giant fisted prince who used his martial arts skills to save his people. And I thank him. You enter a forest full of birds and trees and other trees and you come across an old man. 
Greetings, he says, and he tells you a tale of CRPGs of yesteryear. Baldur's Gate, that was a good one. Oh, Icewindell 1 and 2. <laughs> Those were real CRPGs. That would test your mind. I cast Fireball. The old man stops you with an arcane shield. Please wait, I have many more stories to tell. Of I all cast Fireball. Everybody's dead. The world looks a little different than it used to, is that it? Feels like you're noticing things for the first time that have always been there. Lava will be on seek. Kill them all! A watcher sees them, knows what to look for. No prisoners! From Obsidian Entertainment comes Pillars of Eternity. This is a party-based RPG. Its roots are firmly in the traditions of pen and paper, Dungeons and Dragons, and old-school isometric gaming. It tells a story with beautiful backdrops, well met, affecting voice acting and sound design, and it also has a narrative style that might remind you of a choose-your-own-adventure book at times. Pillars is also full of deep, hardcore RPG mechanics that will not go easy on the inexperienced adventurer. Just a little blood. Leave it to you me. You can trust me. What? Yes, this game is serious RPG business, and it might just capture your imagination. A few years ago, Pillars of Eternity, formerly Project Eternity, was one of the bigger crowdfunded projects around, earning nearly $4 million with over 77,000 backers. Looking at your whole party, looking at a battlefield, uh, I think there's a really great appeal to that, and I think it's a really fun style of game. And with some hefty RPG dev talent behind it, like Icewind Dale's Josh Sawyer and Planescape Torment's Chris Avalone, we were pretty excited. Yes, absolutely. And that tremendous backing support shows that gamers really do want old school CRPGs like Baldur's Gate. And there's an interesting philosophy behind the design of Pillars, which we'll get to in a moment. But first... Five wagons grope blindly for the path on a starless night. The game begins as you and a group of others wishing to make a fresh start travel to a new land. Everybody stays close to the wagons, got it? As you're out collecting supplies, your party is suddenly attacked and you escape to some old ruins. It's here that you discover a strange ritual in progress. Oathbinder, bear witness and see this man has kept his word true to his last breath. And you get the vibe that things aren't going to go well for anyone. Why can't priests and monks just leave old creepy ruins alone, Hex? I know. You wake up shaken and tormented by visions. From this point on, you are a watcher. You have the ability to see into someone's soul and learn who they truly are. I instantly notice the music, Bajo. Oh, it's just so good. Brought a whole wagon full of goods to sell. Not enough shirts for the road. Say, is there anything you need? I've got some basic traveling supplies for sale if you'd like to take a look. It just creates such a fantastic atmosphere. I was safe because I fought, but then this rumor starts that my brother, that he was on the wrong side. You feel like you're playing out some epic fantasy adventure right from the get-go, and you've got the time to take it in as you read through a lot of really well-written prose. Have you come here for me, dear? Or have you gotten lost? Ah, uh, it is both, I think. Yes? Pillars is a game where reading through everything is imperative to the experience, but it's also enjoyable and absolutely worth doing. Agreed. The story plays around with the person's soul and how their soul is connected to their power. Hello. One early example of this is when you meet a traveller called Nonton on the road who seems a bit nervous about something and mentions a particularly nasty bear up north in a cave. So you head up there based on that knowledge and after a tough fight that will kill most players on their first attempt, you discover a corpse. After reaching into the soul of that corpse, you learn that Nonton injured this poor fellow on purpose so he could get away from the bear safely. A smart but nasty move of self-preservation. But then the story deepens back in town. 
you learn that Nonton was secretly seeing his friend's wife, so he had a motive. And then they accuse the dead man of having a nasty temper and being as much a beast as the bear. So now you have some choices. Kill them both, accept a bribe of sorts, let them keep the bribe and live out their lives, or try and report their dirty deed to the magistrate. And this is one of the hooks of this game, tough choices based on what you know and how you're role-playing your character. Are you a thief? A noble? A bit of both? I like to role-play. Jerk. But of course. I just find, Hex, the choices that I tend to lean towards tend to annoy those around me, and we just <laughs> end up fighting regardless. And once again, you really do have to read everything and talk to everyone you meet because you've got side quests all over the place. Yeah, but it's never a chore either because Pillars is so thoughtfully crafted. I especially loved all of the character directions and descriptions in the text. I meant no offence. Let's Simple things such as the woman crosses her arms will help you to understand the context of each interaction better. We don't need your coin. Yeah, it just gives you a better picture of who they are and hints at what's really going on. Yeah, and it's just telling the story without expensive cutscenes, but pairing things back to those descriptive storytelling roots that we love about D&D. And it's so D&D, isn't it? I know you've played plenty of Dungeons and Dragons before, Hex, but I've only been experiencing it for the first time recently, and even those brief interactions with pen and paper gaming have made me feel right at home in pillars with narrative style and overall mechanics as well. Yeah, and I guess that was inevitable coming from these devs who've worked on so many of those old D&D video games. Many of the spells are pretty much renamed D&D spells. But they've also invented their own system and rules here, and there's a lot of mechanics at play. 11 classes, 6 races, a whole variety of weapons and gear to play with that are chock full of stats to crunch. Even on the easiest difficulty, this is a game for those who like sorting through those stats and building and redesigning classes. Yeah, there's a lot of stats going on. I love that combat log hex. Oh, just let those stats crunch over me. Oh, yes. Oh, look at those hits. Oh, oh critical. What's going on there? Oh, all the detail. My eyes are peeled. I love the look of the godlike races, Hex. Such a creepy face. But they can't wear hats, and I'm sorry, but that was a deal breaker. The game does have some fabulous hats. Let us end this! One of the most interesting things about this game is that they've gone for a new approach to class design. These developers have recognised that to build a great class in most RPGs, you often have to plan many levels in advance, know where your class can end up, and try and min-max every role to truly be effective. So instead, they've reshaped how traditional stats work. Yeah, and this is really interesting to get into. You can have your classic rogue, warrior, priest, mage builds, of course, but damage dealt is all based around one particular stat, might, even for spellcasters. Intellect is all about durations and area of effect. So this means you can have a melee fighter with low might and high intellect and be a more than viable class because he's effective in other ways. Now we're quite a ways off from getting into any sort of theory crafting, but it's nice to see that kind of flexibility there. Yeah, and you know, you and I have played a lot of RPGs between us, but even so, the freedom in this game was quite daunting. Yeah, absolutely, and I think what they're trying to do is give you that freedom but not wreck your build. Because there's nothing worse than going into a dungeon and finding that you can't unlock some doors, or you don't have any of the stats needed to open up specific dialogue quest options with a character. Getting totally stuck isn't fun. Yeah, and you know, that still will happen to you, especially if you're not making certain members of your party good at specific traits. But you can hire brand new companions for peanuts at local inns. They won't have much to say, unlike the game's story-driven companions that you pick up. This is the home of the man responsible for those hanging corpses. You don't plan on knocking, do you? But they can basically be crafted from scratch. And it works well. It lets you fill in the gaps in your party when you need it. And you'll often run into situations that you're far from prepared for. Perhaps a little rest is in order. Yeah, at first I thought I was doing something wrong because I was dying so much. But it's just the way these dungeons troll. <coughs> Not to alarm you. But I'm slowly dying. Damn it, poison. Massive spikes in enemy difficulty to give you a shock, and to try and make you come back later when you're a higher level. Leave it to me! Bring them down! Curse your eyes! 
and more importantly, better at the game. It's brutal at times. Mage and priest spellbooks can be huge as well. On your word. And once again, like D&D, you don't have unlimited spells and ability uses in a fight. Some can only be used per encounter, and some per rest, which requires you to make camp with finite supplies, or go to your stronghold to rest up. Having to judge when to use your supplies to rest is fantastic strategy, and it's something that games in this genre usually struggle with, when to refresh those abilities. Yeah, but it's such a fun and often messy way to approach a fight, isn't it? I mean, you're always trying to figure out how many spells or abilities you should use in a particular encounter. Because you don't want to lose the fight, and you certainly don't want a character to die, you have to save up as many spells as possible for the tougher enemies in the dungeon, who usually have a lot of bodies. Mm. Grave Delphilophilies. Yes, quick save is your friend. It's nice to see there's a lot of hard mode options as well for players who really want to test their skills. Such as the trial of iron mode, which deletes your save file if your character dies. I did find the combat a little fiddly at times though. I mean, the interface isn't perfect. Yeah, I struggled a bit too, especially just selecting enemies and players when things are getting messy. Quite often I'll be trying to assign a spell to a particular cool. character and then I'll misclick and just have to do it all over again. Ready, watcher. I just wish the whole interface was a bit more polished, a bit more information on screen about what's actually happening. Yeah, all of the casting bars and visual indicators are quite small, so trying to figure out who's who and who they're targeting, it can be a little tricky. Yeah, and part of that is because of the isometric view of the game, which is also a bit of a problem when there are trees in the way. Well. But if you can push through that and some of the average pathfinding during fights, there is some rich combat to enjoy. This is a pause and fight game. You'll pause constantly to reassess what's going on. There are excellent auto pause options and it's worth putting on auto slow combat too, which slows down fights so that you can keep an eye on everything. It has all those speed up and slow down options that we wish all those older games had. Yes, and seconds matter in these fights. What? You know, even with the ability to pause though, Bajo, I found myself panicking all the time. It's quite a journey of combat discovery, isn't it? Absolutely. I'm quite enjoying getting better at the combat slowly. Hmm? Yeah. I can't stop thinking about this game. <laughs> it's like that, isn't it? There's always something pulling you back in. So many beautifully written little stories and characters whose quest lines we haven't finished playing out. And the choice and consequence RPG mechanics make it so compelling. What are you giving it? I do think you have to like this style of game to truly get into it, but fans of the genre will see this as a real gem. I'm giving it four and a half out of five stars. I'm loving this too. This is the most D&D-like game I think we've ever played, and it's not even officially d and I'm giving it four stars. you wish. What would you like to do next? Uh, I guess the game for this week. Roll a guess check. You are unsuccessful. Everybody's dead. It was Orn from 2004. You played as Hydra, who was making her way through the tunnels of Zebeth after a crash landing. Heavily influenced by Metroid from 1986, the game is set in the same universe but acts as a prequel to The Adventures of Samus. And it was our name the game because it was developed by Tom Happ, the same developer behind this week's Axiom Verge. And fun fact, he developed that game as part of his master's degree and I'm happy to say he got an A. Oh, nice one. Next week on the show, as part of the ABC's look back at the legacy of the Anzac spirit, we have an entire episode exploring the theme of war in games. And as part of that, we also have a first play of a game called Sunset, which is set during a time of conflict. We hope you will join us for what will be a very special episode. Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Bound you out. Hex, for some reason, I've started playing Counter-Strike every day again. Really? Yeah, but... CSGO or...? CSGO. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I've been playing this game for like 16 years, so I'm actually... 
I've been playing it longer than some of the people who play it exist. Yeah, but they're younger than you, so. <laughs> they're a lot younger. So those reflexes. I've forgotten, I forgot about trash talk, though. I don't know how to trash talk anymore. Oh, it's another, another language. Yeah, they're all slamming me with stuff. And I'm like, yeah, well, my, my mother is lovely. <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> Two kids met me the other day and they said, oh, this is hackers. And I was like, no, it's hex. And they were like, no, it's hackers meeting you. Like, it's hectic. Hackers <laughs> is short for hectic. Do you go like that? <laughs> <laughs> you do that with them. Isn't that what the kids do in that gangster?